We're going straight for rock and roll or what? Okay. We're broadcasting. Beautiful. And there are uh, people who are popping in. Yeah, I can see them coming in very quick. <laughs> So, Ishan, remind me again. I know I, I probably asked this multiple times. Where are you based out of? So, uh, I'm currently in Toronto, Canada. So, weather is definitely uh, definitely started to change over here. Ouch. Yeah, actually, behind me, I got the, the first day. Um, so I'm wearing a jacket. So, uh, it's, uh, the summer is, is, is gone now. What about yourself? Uh, Los Angeles right now. Actually, I was just up in Canada for the last two, two or three days. We had a company offsite up in the wilderness of Canada, like Kamloops up in that area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a four hour drive out of Vancouver. Uh -huh. so, uh, like a little house on a lake. So it was cozy. We have about 30 people in the company now. Uh, when we reserved the house, I think we'd, we'd reserved it for, I mean like 20 people. So it was, it was a uh, close, close quarters. Yeah, and that's not far from LA to Vancouver. That's not that's not too too it bad. Was, uh, probably like a five. Well, fly to Vancouver and connect through to Kamloops. Oh yeah, uh, that's right. Also, welcome everybody who's joining. We're gonna probably uh, I think we got one more minute. I only see thirty five people on so far now, which I know. Let's see here. Give me give me a second, everyone. Okay. Looks like people are coming in, getting their coffee or in their water or their tea. Uh -huh. How's how's the weather in LA right now? Uh, it's nice. It's hot and sunny. Yeah? Yeah, but it kind of varies, you know. This morning it was cold and foggy and it, it burned off. Okay. So I don't know how many people are calling in from in the States or outside the United States, but if you want to throw in the, in the chat room, so if you see there's a chat, you can say hi and where you're coming in from. Like I'll, there you go, I'll put in, I'll put the first one in there. There we go, Let's see Scott, it's in calling from Atlanta. Uh, we got someone from Vancouver, Jacqueline. Oh, yeah, Poland. All right. By the way, from <laughs> Poland, there's publishers. So I, I don't know how long it'll take, but I foresee getting at least one book translated into Polish and published in Poland, hopefully next year. So we'll see. Yeah, that'd be nice. There's a company called Aileron, which is probably the, the leading contender for that. So we got people from all around, like see Phil from San Diego and I watched Sean yeah. Finder from Toronto. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Vancouver again. Yeah. So we'll get started. We, it's, uh, it's 11.04. All right, so I'm going to just close this off. Now, keep in mind, there's the chat. If you actually have a question that you want answered, there's a separate Q&A box. It's actually better to do that because the chat just kind of scrolls through. And at the end, uh, actually, while I'm going, Sean, you can check Q&A if you see something appropriate. Yep. But the q Q&A in your control panel, questions, that's where you put it rather than chat, which probably will get lost. So today we're going to talk about outbound metrics, mistakes, and how to improve them. So you got myself, Aaron Ross. There's also Sean Finder here. Let me see if I get my buttons working. Uh, I'm going to close the chat. Uh, now, if you are new to this, or maybe to me, uh, I've written, co-written a couple books, Predictable Revenue, and From Impossible to Inevitable. And we've seen, you see, these have helped create billions in value across all kinds of companies, originally Salesforce.com, but also in other big companies, Oracle and SAP. We've, there's all around the world, I mean, Brazil and China and Europe, um, but a lot of small companies, right? Probably as long as you have a half a million to a million revenue. So all kinds of companies, big, small, and I, know, I, I have some other books in the work, but they're not in the works, but they're not very close yet. So these are the ones that we're going to, I tend to focus on. Now, another fun fact about me is you may or may not know that actually, sorry, here's the, the Chinese cover of the impossible book that's coming out. I just thought it was kind of cool. Red rocket. The, the title there is going to be called one to N. All right. Cause sometimes they change the titles. So yeah. Both books are coming out in Mandarin very soon. 
In fact, the predictable revenue book, just again, fun fact is titled there, the winning B2B sales Bible. Because I think predictable revenue didn't quite translate. Just like the site in China is different. The site we have is uh, dragonceo.cn. So anyway, I also have a lot of a big family. There's actually nine kids. We fostered some more, but big family. And I'm here joined with Sean Finder, CEO of Auto Close, based in Toronto. Yeah. Sean, do you want to say hi and just share a fun fact about yourself? Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, um, I'm the, uh, I haven't written any books yet, um, but uh, I am the CEO of Auto Close, a sales automation platform. Uh, a fun fact about me, I don't have nine kids, but I, uh, I used to play uh, semi-professional tennis. So a lot of people know me from my tennis days um, back in the day in a lot of my younger years. Um, but um, it's going to be a good webinar. We're going to give you a lot of good tips and, uh, and how to improve your outreach. So I look forward to working with Aaron on this and, uh, yeah. and get going. So in auto close, we said, you know, we built sales automation, outbound automation. So uh, we're going we're gonna to start with some of the basics around process and then near the end, get more towards like the metrics and granular details of improving the metrics. So one of the things I'm, I'm flagging these days is really try to help people understand there's this Uber trend. This Uber trend is just more stuff, more content, more overwhelm, more messages, more channels. And so both salespeople and buyers get overloaded with decision paralysis because there's just too many, like which app do I use? Well, now there's a thousand apps for everything. So ultimately, uh, I see this around the house, like when kids just get confused and they're just like, ah, what do I do? I'm overwhelmed. Right, this is like that. I need help. So I think what we look for are just some rough clues around if your sales process and outbound process are working as well, they should, you should see uh, if you have salespeople, because some of you probably don't, but if uh, the problems would be if you have less than 70% of your reps meeting quota, more than 10 or 10, more than 10% are leaving the company every year, whether they're they've quit or are fired. And you just have unpredictable leads and appointments, or maybe Sometimes you win some and sometimes you don't. Uh, some of the problems that lead to this, right, this, this overwhelm and why people are struggling in sales is superficial sales specialization, right? That's something that I'm known for, which we'll, we'll talk about what that means. Outbound is often misunderstood and just metric mistakes. Right? So these are the ones we're going to focus on those problems. And if I had to summarize predictable revenue in one word, it really would be focus. It's about the right customers with the right message at the right time, the right process. Because if you think about as this overwhelm increases, you have to counteract that to keep people sane and on target. So if you can reduce that overwhelm and complexity for both your customers and your people or salespeople, that is really how you can win here. And it's a never ending battle. If there were 500 sales apps or marketing apps five years ago, today there's 5,000 of each in, in five years, it might be 50,000. And if there's exponential growth in the apps, also with more channels, more messages, more everything. So how are we talking three steps to making more money? So the solutions to those three things, like right, sales specialization, where people go wrong, you know, adding outbound to inbound and accurate metrics, ones that work. So I hope everyone's familiar with this idea of sales specialization. It's just, instead of a salesperson doing everything, You've got inbound lead responders, outbound prospectors, new business, new customer salespeople, and sort of post-sales roles, account management or customer success. And so if you have more jobs where people do fewer things better, if you are the only person selling, you are ju there's just the CEO, you do this with your time if you need to. Or maybe, uh, uh, so for example, like you don't prospect enough, you have to block out a day, or you aren't talking to your current customers enough. You might block out some two hour periods during the week. So you, that's how you'd focus as a, a small team before you can hire more. But this is essential. You have focused time or a focused job. This is probably the number one step to make sure you can cut through the overwhelm and do things better. So here's where some people go wrong on this. And again, if you don't have the right setup with your people, then the metrics, getting the right metrics isn't going to matter. This is why we're starting here. So just some examples on how you can take this because the idea is focusing people on doing fewer things better. So sometimes it makes sense to split list building from the prospectors. And sometimes, so for example, marketing might buy the database or you might have some sort of outsourced company do the list building. Uh, and the prospectors aren't doing all themselves. 
Okay. There's always some kind of balance there, but that's, that's something you have to evaluate. Are they spending too much time during the day building their own lists? If they're spending three hours a day list building, it's too much. Another one is make sure that if you have more than two people on the junior, the SDR team, right, the inbound lead responders and outbound prospectors, inbound and outbound have to be separated as soon as you can. If you have one person, yeah, they juggle. But as soon as you can, like here's an, sometimes people have three or four SDRs and they're, they're mixing inbound and outbound and they, they just don't mix. There's different rhythms, metrics, process. They just don't. If you, if you, I hope you take my word for it. If you don't, I guess you can put a question in the box. And the third one is, again, split closing from customer success. You know, when you have salespeople who are signing up customers, don't make them maintain all those customers. I mean, they could hang on to a small number under five for them to maintain as like key accounts. But most of the customers that are signed up by a, a new business salesperson need to be managed and maintained by a separate team, right? Whether you call it account management or customer success or something else that needs to be separated. Okay. So those are the common areas people go wrong. There's a couple of useful metrics. If you have inbound leads, if you're lucky enough, usually it's about 400 per month that have to be reviewed by a human is what one full-time inbound SDR can handle or MRR market response rep, whatever you want to call it. And typically one prospector can support anywhere from one to four closers. Not more than that. If you support more than that, they get too scattered. So if you have one prospector and 10 salespeople, some of your salespeople will not get that support and that's okay. All right, just a couple of final things on what people say, hey, I, why I can't do this, we're too small. I already said, start with your calendar. And the other one is, well, won't service and relationships suffer? I don't want someone to be prospecting and then pass it off. Well, the problem is if you don't do it, you get erratic service. Some cut, so one salesperson is prospecting and then they, pat, then they keep maintain that relationship. Sometimes they give great service and sometimes they don't. It's just, it's erratic. But if you have a person at each step of the buying process dedicated to that step, whether it's an inbound lead or outbound prospecting and then signing a new customer and then support, the customers get great service at every step of their experience. You just have to have a smooth handoff process, which really is not that hard. I promise. If it's hard, you're not doing it right. Okay, that was number one. Number two, add outbound to inbound. Right, outbound is often misunderstood. It's this sort of, um, you know, we only have to do cold emailing. We only have to do cold calling. Or for companies that are too successful at inbound, uh, how, like, we, we, we're good. Well, now our family was successful at having babies. I guess call that inbound. But we also went outbound for more children. That's, that's the, the picture here. This is Rosie and Maverick. And we have inbound and outbound, and it's been a great, great fit. They go great together. Now, you may not know that a lot of the companies that I would assume are the most famous for being inbound companies, including companies like HubSpot and Marketo, which defined the word inbound, but also Google. Did you know SurveyMonkey does outbound? Did you know Facebook does outbound? Okay, so the point is, there's a lot of companies. Now, if you're here at the, on an outbound measures webinar, but you might have an executive senior person who's just like, why would we do outbound? We, we already have enough leads. No, you don't. That will change. All these come at some point to outbound. So if you're sort of too successful at inbound, and we see this, you, just, you get so many leads you can't keep up, and then you create this reactive sales culture, which works for a few years. And then when your inbound leads plateau, because they always do, you have a much, much harder job to recreate this proactive mentality, this proactive approach, whether it's outbound prospecting or outbound marketing, to restart your lead gen. So if you're too successful at inbound, it means usually you have this, this, this culture change you have to redo at the right time. Um, it means different ideal customer profiles to do inbound and outbound. Like the roles of people can change. Like outbound, adding outbound to inbound creates new kinds of processes and metrics. So it's, it, it can be a pretty significant shift for companies. So anyway, don't wait till your inbound leads plateau to add outbound to inbound. So if you're starting from scratch, okay, you're like, hey, we got all these inbound leads. We want to start outbound. We don't have anything yet. Some of you probably do, but we don't have anything yet. How long is it going to take to create some revenue? 
Well, there's two answers. So it usually takes say four to 12 months to get a team built or to get an outsourced program generating consistent quality pipe. So the first three months might be getting, you know, just call it 10 appointments a month, whether it's your team or not. But the next three months are often making sure those appointments are the right ones and you have a chance of closing things. That can take as long as 12 months if you have, if you lose a key person, like a key manager you hired, if you're in a tough niche, if you have a small deal size, if you, there's a lot of reasons why it can take longer. But it can be from four to 12 months to create an outbound program, whether you're doing it with your own people or outsourced. And it's, in, it's created like a, a predictable pipeline machine. If you have your internal people doing it, you are going typically for each prospector generating, say, five to 15 qualified or accepted opportunities a month. Right? If you see higher numbers, it's usually they're not, uh, you know, it's not confused things like demos and meetings with accepted qualified opportunities. And if you're using some sort of outsourcing provider, I mean, the numbers could be all over, but at least for our companies, our clients, we want to generate at least 10 accepted, uh, 10 appointments a month or 10 handoffs a month. And one of the tests of the quality of this is of the one of the appointments accepted into your pipeline, you want to see at least 20% of them close. So again, to see regular revenue, like it, it can take four to 12 months to build your team and build consistent pipeline. And then an extra sales cycle of length to see regular revenue. Right? So if it takes you six months to build your pipeline machine and your sales cycle for outbound could be is six months, it might take a year to see regular revenue start to come in. We actually are, we'll, we're considering putting up a, sort of like this million dollar club post just because we've seen a lot of our customers, whether we're advising them how to build their team or whether we're doing the outsourcing for them because we, we, sometimes, we do both and sometimes together for companies. There's, we have a, a good number of customers that got sort of no deals closed for 10 or 11 months, and then they closed a, a million dollar contract. So patience and staying the course is so important. We see companies often quit too soon. It's 60 days. Where's my deals? Well, you have a three month sales cycle. Don't let impatience sabotage your program. And again, whether it takes, the, the length of time, there's a lot of variables, like how committed are the executives, how crowded the space, the leadership you get, the first people, your starting model, deal sizes. So this is a lot of these things that factor into it, into how fast who should you get results and how fast should you see revenue. So ultimately, I think what's really important is for a company, you know, when you're starting from scratch, especially, or you have a small team, is to think, hey, are we a growth company or a simple company? A simple company uh, means I don't want to hire, usually I don't want to hire people. I'm too busy. It's too complicated. I just want someone to do it for me. And maybe for the short term, maybe for the long term. If you're a growth company, you, you want to grow. That's the most important thing. It's more important than keeping things simple. You probably have investors, or maybe that's just your mentality. And whether you start with someone prospecting for you in terms of outsourcing or whether you hire your first person yourself, the long-term solution is you're going to have to build your own internal prospecting team and get those metrics nailed down. So here are these different options that we look at for people to start outbound if you don't have one yet. And I'd be curious uh, if you have an outbound team in the chat, maybe throw in how many prospectors you've got. So starting model options, one, you just hire your own people, one or two or three people to start, right? And do it in-house. It's a great way to go if you have the time and energy and attention to hire the right people and coach them. If you don't have that and you don't feel like you don't want it, or you're just too busy, a lot of companies use an external team, like outsourcing, to get the ball rolling. A third option is when you do that in parallel. Right? It's going to take us some time to hire the team, and we want to start now. So we want to start outsourcing now while we start looking for people to hire and like onboard them and so on. And the last one is scrappy, right? You don't have a lot of time or money. You might be just a CEO or one person. You're just trying to do it in bits and pieces. So the scrappy, if, you, uh, if that's all you have, it's not, you might as well start there. But you're not going to create results. You're just not. You're not going to create results like revenue and regular pipeline until you have a dedicated resource doing this. A full-time prospector internally or a dedicated like a, I would say a real outsourcing company, not like an intern 
off Upwork and you take it seriously, which includes you're getting leads, you're following up on them and you're trying to figure out how do you close the leads you get. Anyway, last couple tips here. Uh, when you're starting out, if you're going to hire, avoid remote hires in the beginning, if you can, um, in, unless it's like a really special person. It's just a lot harder and a lot riskier. And when you start something new, it's better to start with two, two people when you can. The third one from outbound is don't forget, make phone calls. Use the phone. It works. There's lots of ways you can use it. You can use it. Don't stick just to tapping on your computer with email and social messaging. Right, use the phone. And here, as we start to transition to the metrics part in Sean's section, I'm going to say, hey, outbound, people obsess about these you know, email templates. So like outbound is not all about, you know, there's all this AI stuff, email templates, account-based sales, account-based anything, apps, or lists, right? Those are all important or can be towards making something work. But ultimately, the number one thing that is really the most important with creating a, an outbound program that's successful and sustains itself are the dashboards. It's your metrics. So this is our family car, a Sprinter. Like if our dashboards don't work accurately, we don't know how fast we're driving. We don't know where we are with our, map, our maps and dashboards. We don't know are the tires, like we have this, our tire gauge pressure indicator is always wrong. I don't know if the tires are flat or not. Right, so if, you're, if your dashboards aren't accurate and they're surprisingly hard to be accurate and outbound because there's a lot of subjectivity then everything else is harder. So ultimately, no matter how you get started, the metrics are what define your success in creating revenue and scaling outbound prospecting program. So at a high level, you are defining activity metrics, right? How many emails or conversations or social message, social, that sounds like a tongue twister, social messages, <laughs> social messages are you sending, right? How many responses are you getting, including how many email responses or conversations or meetings? Are those turning into qualified opportunities that are checked and audited every single one? Again, because there's a lot of subjectivity here. And what you don't want are salespeople who think, oh, you know, my prospectors, they're working really hard. I'm going to do them a favor. I'll just accept this. No, 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 no. Nobody wins there, ultimately, because you're, you're messing with the integrity of the whole system and the metrics. And the last one, win rates. So you want to, you want, you ultimately, you, you, this is where it takes time to flesh this all out. And you go through like sales cycles to understand what your funnel is. And we can really can be six is probably fast, really nine months to 18 months to get this from top to bottom, including your revenue rates fleshed out because of sales cycle links. And when you're building this out, just some last tips, uh, I see people using like, if you use salesforce.com, don't use leads for outbound. You have to use accounts, right? That one to many place. We have multiple people in one place. Don't tie comp just to straight meetings. What's the quality of the meetings? Uh, and if, you're, if you have inbound leads, hopefully you do. It's not everybody does. And outbound prospecting, don't lump them into the same dashboard unless it's kind of like an executive summary. You need different operating dashboards, one for inbound, one for outbound, because they're different metrics. They're not apples to apples. And I've already mentioned this, but one more time, especially with outbound, every single opportunity that is accepted and is a candidate for quota needs to be audited checked because if you don't have this trustworthy dashboard and the metrics if you don't really know what you have if the integrity of the program will fail for example if um some benioff would email me once in a while saying hey we had this big deal close like this half a million dollar million dollar deal outbound says they sourced it your team says they sourced it but a partner says they sourced it so who's right and if I couldn't answer that, if, I, if our team had claimed credit for a deal that we didn't deserve, one talk takes us one time and then he's not going to trust anything we, we, we create, right? So I was incredibly diligent. You might even say paranoid about only taking credit, only allowing credit on the deals that we truly believed could be outbound sourced. And we never had a problem, which is why at some point, uh, Benef was a skeptic, but he got behind the program and we grew the, the program to be, there's probably hundreds, hundreds of outbound prospectors at Salesforce today. And why was he skeptical? At Oracle, he saw the inside sales reps were just paper pushers. They didn't add incremental value, or incremental revenue. So you have to define that and make sure that you, it's trustworthy. So you know if you're claiming 5 million in outbound revenue, it's 5 million. 
if it's 10 million inbound, it's 10 million. You want, cause you, so you, if you don't have the executive trust of the numbers, you really, you're not going to go very far. And when you do have that and you have the sense of, okay, Acquia had three prospectors in six months and they got some data and they realized, oh, right, we're seeing, we're expecting 720,000 from each outbound prospector. If we just hire 40 more prospectors, we're going to get an extra 30 million revenue because they believed it. They had the right metrics, the right, they had confidence in it. And they were able to add that revenue over a couple of years and break that hundred billion dollar revenue run rate. So with that, we're going to turn it over here to Sean. We got some metrics mistakes and have them proven to get a little more tactical, a little more into the weeds, because again, with auto close, which helps automate some of the emailing and process and sequencing metrics are really what you help people live in. Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, and you know, looking back at all our clients, one of the big things I don't think people do enough is, as as Aaron mentioned, is look at your dashboard, look at your statistics, and and always continue analyzing um, the different metrics. So what I want to do today is I'm going to go through some different metrics that you should be looking at, talk about some advice on how to improve them, and then also other factors that might um, increase or decrease those metrics for you. Yeah. So, so I gave you control. Let's see if you try to see if it works. Yeah. All right. There we go. We're in action. Okay. So the first one I want to talk about is delivery rate. So delivery rate equals deliveries divided by sent. Very straightforward. Um, this metrics will help you tell you how mailable um, the list you have is. So why is that important? Um, because, you know, people always want to have 100% delivery. Uh, if everyone had 100% delivery, we'd all be living in a, a very good life right now. But the, the truth is, it's tough to have 100% delivery. Um, and what you mean are emails being delivered that don't get caught in spam? Exactly. So emails being delivered that don't get caught in spam. So what you want to do, one way to help this is um, what we tell our clients is if you are buying a list or using, for example, on AutoClose database or another database, what you want to do is continue to validate that list because we all know, you know, someone might work at a company today, tomorrow they might not be. So you want to continue. I recommend every month, but if you can't do every month, probably every quarter it would be good to, um, to clean that list. What we benchmark and what we see is, you know, the typical um, uh, delivery rate is about 93 to 94%, which is good. We have some clients who are 99, but that'll depend on uh, a few different things. The first thing of advice I would say is, you know, pick the right email server. Um, if you're encountering a low delivery rate, then um, that might depend on what your bounce rate might be, um, but you might be incurring an element of blocking. So, what, one thing I might, you might want to do is, you know, cross-reference your, your sending IP and domain with known blacklisting agents to make sure that there aren't any issues with delivery. Um, when you are using, you know, third-party platforms, HubSpot, Salesforce, et cetera, you will be using their email servers as well. Um, so if, um, if they see that it's a marketing or promotions, you might end up in a marketing or promotions folder that actually might hurt your delivery rate um, as well. So you also want to, one last thing is you want to also check is, uh, is spam. Um, you know, try avoiding um, using spam words, et cetera, inside to, to help with your delivery. So um, just a few other factors I want to mention um, to help with delivery rate would be, you know, certify your IP. You know, I would avoid using capital letters. I always ask our clients, avoid using capital letters too much in your subject, in your subject line. Um, misleading subject lines. You don't want to mislead your readers. Um, and obviously one last thing is um, don't add too many links to your message. The more links you add, the more look, it looks spammy, et cetera. Um, and that actually hurts your, uh, your delivery rate. Okay. Uh, the next important, um, you know, outbound metrics mistake is, you know, open rate, which is unique opens over your delivery. So this is the unique opens of people opening your emails um, divided by how many you are delivering. So, you know, this metric will influence your send, sending strategy, to be honest with you. Um, it will depend on, you know, how good is your data? You know, it could be, you know, what day slash time is your message going out? Um, funny enough, I find if you are reaching out to C-level people, you're actually getting at a higher open rate on a Saturday or Sunday morning between like 8 and 10 a.m. than you might during the week on a Monday to Friday, simply because C-level people are very busy. They have not only prospects and clients and other people emailing them, but they have their internal employees and other people emailing them. So if you have 250 emails, you're getting Monday to Friday and you're getting 10, 15 on a Saturday or Sunday, that might actually help in, uh, sort of help your, uh, your open rate um, being opened by your prospects. 
Um, one other practice is a great practice we always recommend is a lot of people call it A-B testing. I don't even think it should just be A-B. I think it should be A, B, C, D, E. You should always be testing. You should be testing more than just A and B um, in, in order to find out what subject line works the best. Um, another, another good tip for open rates is the email you're actually sending from. Um, are you sending your emails from a hello at marketing at sales at email or are you sending it from a Aaron at Sean at, you know, Mark at email? Um, that might help because if somebody, you know, sees an email and says it's coming from, you know, sales at autoclose.com, for example, I mean, they're going to know it's a sales email right before they even open it. So that might actually hurt your open rate by using um, those emails that, uh, those, those email addresses that are the hello and, and sales at. Um, one, one way to test it is, you know, is, is for your subject line especially, is to take two to three subject lines and say, okay, I'm going to send uh, 100 emails to A, B, and C out of 1,000 or 2,000 emails that you want to send out. When you send that first 100, you might have a 15% open. The second 100 might have 20, 20%. And the third might have, you know, 30%. What you want to do is find out what works. And like I like to say, it's just double down in it. So you want to take that what works and just continue to take the rest of your list and put them through that to help get that open rate. Um, one last thing about open rate that can help is if you do email uh, specific people and they're very engaging. So they've engaged with you, they're engaging to your emails, they're opening your emails, continue to focus on the, that pool of people and that will definitely um, help your, your open rate. Okay, so the advice I give is to segment and personalize your message. Um, you know, if you're going to send an email and, you know, you're going to focus on every industry, try and find out what industry works. What I like to do um, with ours is find out, okay, out of all of our clients, how many clients do we have in manufacturing, finance, technology, etc.? And then you find out where it could be industry or it could be geographic area. You know, if I have if 40% of my clients are from California, well, double down on your California list because that's where your clients are really resonating with you. So make sure you take that advice and you find a list and you find that niche and you continue to personalize that message to those people in that segment. And personalize your message. Um, if you're, if you're, you know, you're writing hi there or hi mister or hi miss, it's just going to hurt your open rate. You know, personalize that message to Aaron, you know, hi Aaron, um, and make sure you, um, you use that to your advantage. So the third one would be, you know, email click through rate. Um, this metrics is very important indicator of whether or not your message, you know, matches your strategy. Um, if you're not getting a high enough email click through rate, this can be because you're not doing enough to convince them to click a link in your email. Um, your list customer list is not segmented um, or maybe the email frequency is not being sent enough. Um, if you're just sending one email um, to your to your prospect or, you know, you're probably not going to get that email click through, but if you continue to follow up and email and continue to email them and follow up with them, not every day, but with a sequence, um, that will definitely help your, your email click through rate increase. Um, and obviously you don't want to have too many calls to action and links in that email um, because you want them to click um, and kind of get rid of all the, the, the bullshit I call, or BS you can call it um, in that email. So what I'm saying is, you know, just remove the distractions from your email. This can be, you know, I've seen people that put, you know, awards, they put other, uh, oh, that skipped. Go back on. Oh, it keeps skipping. Uh, let's go back here. Can we go back to? You got the power, man. Yeah, it's going by itself here. Okay, well, um, hold on. Let me just go back one here. I don't know if I can do this for you. Yeah, there it goes. Is this the right one? Uh, nope, we're still at number three. There we go. Remove distraction. There you go. I don't know why it's going by itself here. Um, remove distraction from your, your email. Um, this can be, you know, people put, you know, the awards. They put, um, you know, different things in their email that have nothing to do with what your end game is to try and get them to click on that, on that call to action that you have to get that email clicked on. Um, you know, we have some clients that put, you know, case studies, they put the awards they've won, they put stuff that you don't want, you don't want your prospect to be focusing on all the other Flutter. stuff. You want them to focus on 
not the clutter, and really what you want to get across to them, um, because you probably have only a short you know, time span, especially in that first three sentences, to grab their attention. Use that to your advantage. Let's see if this works this time. There we go. Okay. Uh, number four, um, you know, outbound lead conversion rate. Um, this is a big one. So you have to maintain a deep understanding of which markets contain the best leads for your business. The number of leads that convert into opportunities will let you know the success of the customer segments you are targeting for new campaigns. Also, it will let you know how the quality of the list you are using are in your campaigns. So what I always tell our clients is to set up a sales cadence. Therefore, even though I hate the word cadence, but I call it follow-up sequence, for example. Funny enough, we have, you know, there's people that email one or two emails and they say, oh, and this is all last year. They say, oh, this person's not interested in moving forward or they did never reply. Well, the truth is everyone's busy. Everyone's getting hundreds. Oh, why'd it go again? <laughs> not sure what happened. I was trying to move the, uh, the chat out of the way of my screen, but. Oh, no problem. Okay. So, you know, setting up two, three, the bottom line is most prospects are actually going to reply to your four, fourth or fifth or even sixth follow-up. Therefore, if you're e emailing a C-level person, you're trying to get their attention on the first two emails or even, you know, a, a manager or a VP, they're very busy. They're not going to reply potentially to your first email. You want to continue the follow-up and continue that in a cadence where it's un in a thread so they can continue to see that you're continuing to follow up. And I'm telling you, um, statistically, the fourth or fifth email will actually get you um, the best results. Other factors that might help your uh, lead conversion rate, have a compelling value proposition. Um, you know, as I said, cut to the chase, get rid of all the clutter, um, you know, increase the trust of your prospect. Try and use that first email to increase the trust in your prospect and you know, offer proofs. You might offer proof why they should, be, why they should talk to you. And lastly, make it easy to reach you. Um, you know, in your signature, you, you know, have a phone number, an email, even, you know, we use Calendly a lot, um, something to have them within one click, they can book time on your schedule and have that meeting with you. Um, so this is the, the, the fifth one and it's analyzing your statistics. We have, you know, tons of people that just go into AutoClose, this is the AutoClose dashboard and, and they come and they look and they look at your open rate, your click rate, your bounce rate, et cetera. They look at everything and they say, oh, I got one prospect from this list. Well, you know, dig in deeper, analyze, analyze in those emails, in those emails sent, which email was the most successful? Was it your initial email? Um, did you get the highest results from, you know, follow up three, follow up four, follow up two? Where did you get the best result from? What was your highest open rate in email two, three, and four? Because what you want to continue to do is analyze every campaign you do and start to double down on what works to get you more leads um, into that funnel for you. Hey, uh, so just a quick question. I think the labels got cut off here. What does this, what are these numbers showing you here that you? Yeah. Okay. So, um, the first is the sent emails. The, okay, the so like 500, you sent 550, but then there's gray and dark blue. Oh, I don't. Oh, so that, yeah, that would be your clicked, your clicked and your yellow would be your bounced. So blue, sorry, the blue, blue is clicked and the yellow bounced. Yeah. And so the it would red, the, the, this, this tiny slice of red is responses. That would be replies. So in okay. this specific campaign, the reason why you see zero applies is because the call to action was to book on the Calendly. So the click is where you're going to see the high results, which was 11% simply because um, my call to action wasn't for a reply, but more for them to book on the Calendly. So, right. So if they book on a Calendly, it wouldn't show up as a email reply. It would just show up as a calendar invite separately. Exactly. So if you didn't put, and for example, you sent an email saying, you know, uh, hi, you know, I'm looking to see which region do you manage, you know, asking a question that will get you the reply. But as you can see, the reply rate is very low yep. because that wasn't the, uh, the call to action in this, on this specific. Yep. Uh, hey, um, sorry, quick question. Someone asked, uh, sorry, I don't remember who it was. What was, you talk about email click rates. What do you, you know, what's some sort of like fair range of, email click-through rates that you tend to look for? So the actual click rates- I don't know if it can range, but just, I don't know. What's like too low, there's a problem versus reasonable? I would say anything under 2% email click rate is, is way too low. Um, okay. we, we find, 
you know, two to three percent. If you're if you're above, you know, four or five percent, you're doing pretty good. And that all depends and comes back to a what your delivery rate on that list is, um, and b um, how good your email service provider is. Because if you're sending out service provider and you know forty percent of those emails are going into your spam folder because you have spam words in your email, that will always determine. So having a clean list will also help all these different metrics. Okay. Uh, I will say just a reminder that sometimes with an email, you're trying to get them to respond to you an email. You're not trying to get them to click through something. So remember the, you know, it's keep it in context. If you're trying to get clicks on yeah. something, it's important. If you're not trying to get clicks on something, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah. And, and that might depend on, as I can, the follow-ups, you know, your initial email might be to try and get a reply and, you know, email three, four might be trying to get clicks. So that all depends. Oh, we can go to the next one. I don't know if it's me. Okay, there we go. So um, inbound qualified lead versus an outbound prospecting lead. Um, Aaron did touch on this. You know, as you guys, an inbound lead would come from certain things like your SEO, um, your content marketing, blogs and white papers. Um, you know, PPC and retargeting might be inbound leads. And then your outbound prospecting lead might come from, you know, like auto close or direct dials. Um, even, you know, LinkedIn, you, you might be doing direct, um, but there's a big difference between the two. Um, and I think Aaron really touched on this um, very good earlier on the presentation to make sure you, um, you distinguish, you know, what the difference between the outbound and the inbound is and uh, obviously the costs associated with it. Yeah. I will say just a side note, uh, I talk about RVP and marketing meaning a lot. And, you know, I think we're going to talk a lot more about outbound marketing to try to help differentiate. There's even in marketing, there's inbound marketing, which really is around like con creating content, uh, social media and SEO. And then there's outbound marketing, which is, you know, could be more like online advertising. Anyway, just try to be further, you know, help people be more insightful around like what's inbound and what's outbound and how do you measure them differently? Yeah. So, perfect. Right. Uh, so I just wanted to, oh, yeah, no, this is a great ebook that you put together right, from auto close. Yeah. So this is an ebook we put together. Um, Sorry, and I'm trying to get this Q and A on my view. Okay. Yeah, there we go. This was an ebook in particular, actually uh, some insight from, from sales expertise um, such as Aaron, you'll see him in the ebook. Um, so I want to provide this as a resource to you guys today. Um, just a good read, you know, on the weekend, et cetera. It's a pretty long read actually about 52 pages. So um, definitely, um, if you want to hear from some of the influencers and, you know, some other more tips and tricks from Aaron, especially um, in there, um, you could actually just download or go to that link right there and, and get your free copy at any time. Yep. All right. So we're going to just summarize here and we'll have time for some questions. All right. So to cut through the overwhelm, right, there's this trend of overwhelm, which I mean, you have to keep finding ways to be more targeted, more focused, more direct, less clutter, whether it's in our email messages, whether it's in our, the kinds of customers we go after, whether it's in our job descriptions, right? So with sales specialization, that was where we started. Usually the answer is add more roles. So it's usually if where people haven't gone far enough in having enough roles, you know, if you're one person blocking time on your calendar for those things you're not getting to that are important. The second one, adding outbound to inbound. So if you don't have a program at all yet, I would suggest starting with picking one person on the team to be in charge of figuring out the plan. How are we going to do this? Are we going to outsource? Are we going to hire? Are we not going to do it yet? We'll do it next year. Like, what's the plan? So assign someone that job because when one person's in charge, then the magic can happen. If you already have a team in place, alternatively, they really usually like fix the dashboards, try to get them clear. And the last step we talked about here was the making outbound metrics accurate that Sean went over with some tips on how do you improve your metrics? Uh, how do you fix the dashboards? Or how do you use more insight to get, uh, to make sure that you're doing what you want to do rather than what you people tell you you should do? So with that, you know, what uh, Predictable Revenue does, obviously we mentioned AutoClose has a software application and there's a 14-day 14 uh, 14 free trial. You can try it out. We'll get to that link in Sean's email. Uh, predictable Revenue, the outbound success company. Whether you want to outsource to us, whether you want us to tell you how to build, whether you want us to, to do the prospecting for you or actually build your team for you, your internal team, we can tell you how to do it step by step so you can get it right the first time. And I actually have seen a lot now just assessments. If you have a team in place, you can do an assessment and tell you exactly what's going well and what exactly you need to change. So for more of either of us, before we get to the questions, right, for us, predictablerevenue.com, pretty easy to find me and us. And on AutoClose, 
autoclose.com or you can email Sean at autoclose.com. Whether you don't remember the ebook link or you want to ask about the free trial or something else. It'll all be on the websites. Yep. And someone asked, sorry, in the questions if it'd be recorded. I'm not sure. I think so. Um, but it's really, uh, our, I, I think my VP marketing would be able to, we have yeah, a it, it is being recorded. Yes. Yeah. So we'll see. I'm sure usually we, I think we email it out, but, uh, Mina, I'll have to ask her about, about when we do that. So we got some questions here. Uh, plus hi, Cody. I got a little hi. One of our, our clients signed up. There's not a lot of questions. Now remember, forget the chat. If you have a question, put it into the Q and a box. Yeah. We got about five, five or 10 minutes for, for questions. So one of them was from actually a new prospector, uh, either AL or Al. I said, hey, how do you suggest a new prospector trains himself to generate more quality leads at the beginning? Well, on one hand, there's a lot of, there's just infinite information about there how to prospect. So that's important, but it is overwhelming. So I do think that anything you could do to find other prospectors who have already been successful and try to and learn from them, whether they're in your company or not. If you don't have anyone in your company prospecting, you got to look outside. But, you know, they're, they're everywhere. Um, ask for friends. You know, if you're in almost any city, there's going to be companies where there's companies with prospectors. Of course, you know, we, there's also online courses at different places, whether um, there's, I can't remember the name, but there's some of those startups that just have all courses on everything. And of course, at Predictable Revenue, we have some courses as well. But there's just, there's really just too much information out there. The problem is how do you ultimately don't just co- learn from people, but don't just try to copy exactly what they do. You have to learn how to use your own judgment, be proactive to go figure it out. So one last tip there. The number one thing prospectors don't do enough at the beginning is interviewing or talking to senior salespeople at their companies and customers directly. The more that you can talk to customers, whether you're shadowing people on calls or interviewing them yourself, the easier it is for you to understand who the right customers are and to speak their language. Don't see that enough. All right. Another question. So I'm going to ask, hey, how uh, basically... I'm trying to get, I'm going to, I'm going to take back the remote control here. A board no control. Okay. So can you give us a look under the hood from Jordan on how we're getting the meetings? I just closed a major account by going to a trade show and shaking hands. Uh, I need email to get the meeting. So how do you, what's the in our life of our platform? Uh, well, the way that we get meetings, so again, we have two sides of the business. A lot of companies use us to prospect for them because they don't want to hire people. They might be a CEO who's just too busy. Maybe they don't feel like they've hired successfully. They just don't, I don't want to hire a salesperson. I don't want to manage them. I just want some appointments. So in that case, we're doing a lot of email outreach to find the right people. A lot on targeting, segmenting the right companies, the right messaging. A lot of times like this question, hey, is predictable revenue and cold calling 2.0 and referral email still work? It's been years and that still works. You just have to be better at what you do. More insightful, more targeted with your messaging to be more real. There's a lot of blah, blah, blah messaging out there. So we do a lot of email, emailing um, when, we, when we're getting appointments for customers. When we're teaching, when we're building teams for companies, we do recommend the phone is, you need to use the phone, use email, use your phone, sometimes use social. So the answer is kind of like what Sean mentioned, you know, target the right customers, um, use direct messaging that m- means something to them, not a bunch of clutter, do a lot of follow-up. And I think the, the missing piece I see a lot of people who, that they don't do is to do the work, not just to learn the process, but to learn how to empathize with customers so you can think like them. I mean, spending time on the phone with them, whether you're the one leading the call or not, interviewing them, reading about their journals, just trying to get into their heads. That's the missing piece and why uh, most prospectors and marketing departments can't write great copy. But they just don't really know their customer. Oh. Yeah, Sean? No, I completely agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we got, let's see. Looking through here. Yeah, why don't you take a quick look? I think it's interesting. By the way, uh, there's a question in the chat. Should you resend emails with the email subject line that works to the group that received the subject line that didn't work? So, I, so there's a question about subject line testing. So, I, you know, look, I find subject lines, sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. For some people, one, one subject line, like, 
quick question or um, appropriate person might work, but the same subject may not for other people. It's just, I don't know, it's, there's no magic with subject lines. I tend to like subject lines that are shorter and a little more intriguing. I think it depends on who the audience is that you're emailing. Yeah. You know, if you're emailing a, an introvert versus an extrovert, like someone in sales versus someone in, in IT, it might be a little different. Because, um, you know, strangely enough, when I do, you know, high first name, um, it gets me actually a very high open rate where people, you know, maybe they don't know what I'm saying inside the body paragraphs. They're, you know, they're more likely to click. But, um, yeah, I usually like to keep it two to three words on the subject line. Yep. So there's a question here from Travis, uh, I think from Vertical Alliance, I think. By the way, I'm, theoretically, should be coming to see you guys for an assessment in October if we just get some final things worked out. What are the benefits of working out of the account versus leads? Next, I mentioned you got to use the account tab versus leads tab. Account-based marketing, we, current, we currently track qualified meetings based on lead conversions to opportunities in Salesforce. And uh, did I, should I mention our customer success team works out of accounts currently, but there's no case management. Okay, so here's the reason why most companies, a lot of companies, if you use salesforce.com, sometimes they, you start prospecting out of leads because it's kind of easy. You just upload some leads there. Well, you've got a bunch of old leads there and you just start prospecting. Or marketing, if you have a marketing executive, is used to leads. So they just assume, hey, we're going to put this in leads. The problem is you don't have that one-to-many account-based view. So if you're talking to, uh, let's use a silly example, Citibank, and you have 50 different leads from Citibank all in scattered, and you can't see the view around all everybody at, Citi, at Citibank. So you need an account-based view where everyone's in one place, everyone who's relevant is in one place to understand really what's going on in that, at that account and to get the right metrics. So it'd be nice to have, again, you've got customer success or support there as well, logging cases, ideally. Um, but it's a little bit different. That's like post-sale. But that's really that account-based view is really is, is vital. And the exception is if you're really selling to individuals or small businesses where there's just one person, then the leads can make more sense because you don't really have multiple people at each company you need to track. Yeah. It looks like we have a few, uh, Bradley and, and Jacqueline, uh, is LinkedIn email as effective as cold emailing? And the second question, which I'll do answer them both together, looks, um, not sure how credible it is, but my manager was saying that he gets 200, 250 emails per day, but only four to five emails. Um, LinkedIn email is, is an effective tool. Um, I'm a, I'm a big advocate of LinkedIn as well. Um, so you know, not only should you be doing the calling like Aaron says and the cold emailing, um, but using LinkedIn and email is, um, is a good tool. What I, you know, what I usually use LinkedIn for in the in-mail is to try and get that email to try and then convert them through a campaign. So use in-mail to try and introduce yourself, build that trust. They can go on your LinkedIn profile, see where you've worked, how many years you've worked, your positions, um, and you kind of break the ice there and then take those emails um, or try and get those emails from LinkedIn and move them into, into a, a campaign where you can follow up. But definitely, yeah. um, I would put LinkedIn into your strategy um, because what I tell people is every person that you're selling to or is buying from you is on LinkedIn. So it's all in one place. It's up to you to go out and, and try and use it to your advantage and, and, and yeah. get involved. I, and I hear some people generally think LinkedIn doesn't work as well as email, but I hear different stories. So a lot of this is you got to try it and see exactly in the unit category does it work better or worse because some people <laughs> you get both there's a question from marianne here do you consider ppc an effective inbound channel for setting up demos we had great results a year ago then it dried up okay so you remember the part around adding outbound to inbound you want to start creating an outbound prospecting program before your inbound leads dry up any channel when you're successful in, in ppc things change so it'll dry up unless you keep evolving it so there might be different ways that you can reignite PPC to get more demos from that again. But again, if you are a fit for outbound, it would make sense as well to start to have both those channels inbound and outbound in place. So you have, um, I say it's, it's more of a, more options to create that, the leads that you need in case one changes or dries up. So Michael here had a question. At what point do you decide to hire more salespeople at ease versus more SDRs? Uh, what's the optimal ratio? So the easy answer is if you have too much pipeline and the salespeople are too busy, you want to hire more salespeople or promote them. Yeah. If you don't have too, if you have salespeople that aren't busy enough with pipeline, you need to hire more SDRs. 
and generate more leads in some way. So that's really the, the simple answer. There's not a magic ratio or number. Most companies have a, so one outbound SDR because you can have inbound SDRs for inbound leads, outbound SDRs. Typically one in, uh, sorry, outbound SDR, outbound prospector for, for three salespeople is pretty common. Two is pretty common. I think I would say if there's one number, like one prospector to three salespeople would be like the most common ratio. Not more than one to four. One prospector supporting more than four salespeople, they're just going to get confused and scattered. Mm -hmm. uh, here, Jacqueline had a, we got a couple, I think we do a couple more questions. Jacqueline had a question. What's your, been your best success rate for new SDR time-wise? You know, this all depends on the company. If you're in a company that has a tough niche, a tough niche might be selling uh, telephone systems or it could be enterprise, you know, it's just like big complex, you know, it can be months. But if you have something more transactional, we have differentiator, you can see new SDRs. If you have the process to find it working already, I mean, they should be able to get some traction in the first month. Great. I think there's a question from Mark for you, Aaron. Uh, Mark Simpson. Okay. Uh, Aaron, I'm helping to monetize a website that sells tons of airline tickets, the core business. Uh, they want to monetize it further by selling ads to agencies, destination marketers, and direct clients. Any tips for this? Uh, I'm the salesperson, prospector, account manager, and ad person. Okay, so here's basically it's we have this business. We're selling airline tickets. We want to expand it to either a new market or a new way to make money from what we're doing. The first thing you do is go to the From Impossible book and read the chapter, Nail a Niche. That is where you start because when you have all these opportunities, we could sell to agencies, we could sell to direct clients, we could sell to marketers, we could sell. You need to pick a small number, one or two, to focus on and not try to do everything. Right? This, there's, too, there's too much chaos that way. So if, really that book, uh, or maybe, it's in, I'll put it in chat, the link. It's fromimpossible.com. There's a link to Amazon, it's Amazon, but it's, it's called Nail a Niche the first part of the From Impossible to Inevitable book. And you got to pick your battles. So if you have five opportunities, five types of markets you can go after, pick two to start, prioritize them. So you won't, if one works, if they don't at some point, then you can go to the next ones. But don't try to do all five at once. Let's see if someone, yep, here, I'll just put the, in the chat. In the chat. Okay, one last question. Let's see what we got. Um, Company profile. Yep. So there's this question around cold calling versus cold emailing. Which should we do? Well, the answer is, is both. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the answer is both. Now, depending on the market, sometimes emailing works better than calling, like in some enterprise places, like especially IT. But sometimes calling works better than email. But you do want to try both and mix both calling and emailing. You know, as Sean mentioned in a sequence. So that's something that, you know, auto close and other apps can help do, which is lay out. Should we send an email, then make a call, make an email call, some sort of order so that you're doing enough follow-up of different types to make sure that you're going to be able to get a response or get in touch with someone. But I would say that over time, what works today works less over time. Cold calling used to work better. It works now. It works worse. Emailing worked better. Now it's declining. Um, LinkedIn goes up and down. The fundamental idea is if you know your customer really well, if you know the type of customers who need you, if you know the people in there, you know what their pains are, then you're going to be more effective. Whatever you use to reach out to them, whether it's LinkedIn, calling, emailing, direct mail, knock on the door, yeah. sending notes via carrier pigeon, handwritten notes any pizzas, whatever the method is, like that's what people miss is they, you don't spend the time to really get to know your customer and the messaging and their problems that how they think. So that's where all uh, my, if I go back to everyone who's emailing calling now, don't forget the fundamentals, go really get to know you, the customer you're calling on. Build that relationship. Know their language. I, one, here's one example. We had a customer called Kemberton. Um, they were one of the customers that, you know, we, we built their, to help them build their team. They had no revenue for us called 10 months and they closed a million dollar, 
you know, like a million dollar customer. They've got millions more in the pipeline. We have a case study coming out. But they originally started with asking questions over email on the phone, like, hey, uh, they sold to the financial departments, the collections departments of hospitals. Uh, who handles your billing? Right? And, you know, they probably got some responses, but not great. Then they switched to the internal language of customers. They'd ask, well, who's in charge of patient cash? And that, it stood out more. It really resonated more. And they got much better results with, again, using the lingo of the customer rather than generic language that they just made up without really really understanding how the customer thought and thinks and used internally. So, all right. Well, I want to thank Sean. Thank you. It was great. Thanks for showing up. Thanks everybody for coming in and asking great questions. I'll find out. I'm sure we'll share the recording if you'd signed up for it. Thanks, and here's Aaron. how to thank get a hold of us. If you have something else you need to, uh, to add, there's Sean's email and we're easy to find out as well. So thanks everybody. Again, thanks Cody and all of the vertical lines people as well. Thanks for all the questions. Bye. Bye, guys.